Welcome everyone to the OPC's book night with Mark Clifford to discuss his new book, Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World. What China's crackdown reveals about its plans to end freedom everywhere. I'm Patricia Kranz, the executive director of the Overseas Press Club. I'm delighted to welcome Mark tonight and our moderator, Jody Schneider. Jody was based in Bloomberg's Hong Kong Bureau from 2016 to 2020 and served as president of the Foreign Correspondence Club in Hong Kong in 2019 and 2020. As soon as Jody returned from Hong Kong to New York last year, she joined the OPC and was elected to the board in the summertime. She is now political news director at Bloomberg News here in New York. I now hand it over to Jody. Thanks, Patty. Um, and I'm happy to welcome everybody to uh, this book night. Uh, I only wish it were in person, but I'm very pleased to introduce Mark Clifford, who I overlapped with in Hong Kong, and I'm pleased to call a friend and very excited to discuss this new book with him. Uh, we welcome questions, so please send them along. Please send them in the chat. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you don't want me to use your name, say that, or if you want to keep it, just DM me in the chat. So it's, uh, so your name's not attached, you can do that as well. Uh, thank you. Um, first, a brief bio of Mark, a little introduction before we get started discussing his thought provoking book. Mark is now living in the US and is president of the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, he, uh, in Hong Kong, he most recently was executive director of the Asia Business Council and a former member of Next Digital, the company that published Apple Daily, a subject he discusses extensively in this book in which we will talk about tonight. Uh, Mark is editorial chair of the Asia Re Asian Review of Books and had the distinction, I don't know if he was the only one uh, perhaps, of serving as editor in chief of both English language uh, daily paper or papers in Hong Kong, the Standard and the South China Morning Post. He also has a PhD in Hong Kong history from the University of Hong Kong. Um, as Patty noted, I was president of the Foreign Correspondence Club uh, in Hong Kong in 2019 and 2020. So I had a front row seat when the widespread anti-government protests occurred in Hong Kong. And also as the crackdown started in 2020, uh, very swiftly with the imposition uh, by the Chinese Communist Party of the national security law uh, upon Hong Kong. Um, I'd like to start there, Mark, by talking to you about that crackdown as it's central to the theme in your book. Uh, in the book, you say that never uh, in modern history have we seen a free, open, modern society essentially destroyed in a matter of months. Uh, a, a chapter in your book is even called the first postmodern city to die. Please tell us about that and how that happened and how, as you say in that chapter, much of what occur happened occurred because the idea that a city exemplifying capitalism on steroids uh, being reunited uh, by a, a country run by the Communist Party was always somewhat preposterous. So can you talk to us about first the, you know, how rapidly this occurred and on what it was based? Yeah, well, thanks, Jody. Uh, really nice to be doing this discussion with you. Hope to see you in person uh, sooner rather than later. Um, last time I saw you was in Hong Kong, I guess, probably around the time the NSL national security law came into, into being. Um, Look, uh, I think, you know, most of you watching this uh, know that uh, Hong Kong was promised 50 years with a high degree of autonomy uh, after the Chinese uh, resumed sovereignty in 1997. It was, you know, I think we all wanted to not just hope for the best, but work for the best and take China at its word that uh, the promises of universal suffrage, among other things, would be implemented, that this high degree of autonomy would be um would would be hewed to by the Chinese. And of course, it was um, these were promises that were made in first in an international treaty, uh, the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984, a treaty filed at the United Nations, and then in the form of the basic law, the mini constitution that China promulgated a few years before the handover. Um, 
But I think China's, you know, China really did not, does not understand what makes Hong Kong tick, what makes it special. And I think they were quite fine to promise uh, free elections. Um, and bear in mind, these are elections for the mayor and the city council. We're not talking about an independent Hong Kong. Uh, it was really China that put that idea in people's heads because it was so um, so overbearing. But um, I, I, don't, I, I wanna give the floor back to you a little bit, Jody, but I, I think that after 20 something years after the struggles, uh, first of uh, the 2003 protests uh, of a half a million people or so against the, the national uh, kind of earlier version of the national security law, then the uh, umbrella movement, the Occupy Central movement of 2014, when the central district was occupied for 79 days by protesters. Uh, and then, of course, the, the summer of 2019, that summer of democracy, the frustration among Hong Kong people as Beijing tightened the screws more and more and became clear that Beijing had no intention whatsoever of allowing free elections unless China knew who was going to win and it was their guy. So um, let me let me kick it over to you because I don't want it to be a monologue, Jody. Sure. Well, and so let's talk a little bit about that and the protests, which we will, you know, which you do a lot in your book. And um, I think most people are familiar with how in uh, 2019, it started out as uh, protests in a protest city, by the way, Hong Kong you know, likes to protest and they're good at it. Um, uh, but it started against the extradition law that Carrie Lam was uh, going to uh, impose so that basically uh, people could be extradited back to China with its opaque uh, uh, legal system. And it, but then it grew into something else. And there were, you know, at one point, perhaps as many as 2 million people protesting that. And then it became fewer people, but more, more somewhat radical, sometimes violent uh, on both sides. The, the police um, increasingly uh, using uh, tear gas and rubber bullets, and sometimes even shooting some live bullets. Uh, and, uh, and very anti, virulently anti-China on the part of uh, the protesters and, and increasingly in the community where it spilled over, uh, people would boycott uh, Chinese owned, mainland owned businesses, that kind of thing. How much do you think of this crackdown, which came you know, just a year after, uh, during the, the pandemic, by the way, under the cover of the pandemic, how much is, do you think the, uh, the protest be happened because the protests became very embarrassing to China and especially to Xi Jinping as the rhetoric became increasingly anti-China? Yeah, well, I think uh, it's a really good question. And I, I guess it'll be really interesting if someday in a different China, we can have access to the archives and the decision making. But uh, it was very clear by the end of 2019 um, that uh, China was the Beijing was going to move and, and move hard. And I think that's unfortunate because even after the the extraordinary protests, as you say, as many as two million people at some at some rallies in a city of seven and a half million people, and and these were not people coming in from mainland China. I mean, these were really pretty much all Hong Kongers. It would be, uh, yeah, it would be the equivalent if you took it proportionally in the U.S. of something around eighty million people coming to Washington. I mean, it's just extraordinary how the city was caught up in this. And I think that China was counting on this kind of silent majority, it's it, what they call the blue wave, um, to, um, to back them um, and back the pro-Beijing line in district council elections held at the end of November 2019. So after these months of tumult and, as you say, increasing violence uh, on both sides, um, the election, election day came and uh, it turned out that as in every election in Hong Kong, about six out of 10 people voted for the pro-democracy candidates. And it was an unbelievable sweep for the pro-democracy camp. Um, and these were for uh, the district council, essentially ward councillors of the lowest level. But it really showed community support for democracy, even after the violence, which I, like many other people, I thought would turn a lot of uh, people against the, the protesters. So I think, you know, rather than using that as a kind of pause or a reset, and it had the political situation and calmed down, um, and a chance for negotiations, I think in any open society, a government would fall or would negotiate. And, um, you know, even in places like South Korea in 1987, very authoritarian place, faced with massive street protests, the government gave in to protesters, negotiated with them. But Beijing couldn't do this. And so Xi Jinping's response was to send down two 
really hardline, tough people want, uh, to basically take charge on the ground in Hong Kong. And one of them uh, was best known for breaking up Christian churches, literally physically smashing churches in Zhejiang. You send people like that in and you get you get one kind of answer. It's a hardline answer. And I, I jumping forward a little bit, I'll just finish by saying, I don't think we've seen the bottom yet. The new People's Liberation Army commander for Hong Kong uh, previously ran an elite and seemingly very violent uh, commando unit in Xinjiang, hunting down and apparently killing um, uh, you know, people they regard as, as Muslim terrorists or separatists. So you, know, you sent people like that to Hong Kong. Again, it was a free, peaceful, prosperous city, but you send people that are hardline um, security people from the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, and you're going to get a particular outcome. In the book, you talk a, a great deal about the notion of Hong Kong as this very free, open, capitalist city, a, pa a peace place where basically people flock to make money. And anybody who spent time in Hong Kong uh, you know, sees that. Um, there's other sides, but there's the gleaming, you know, the huge office towers. And, and it's, you know, uh, until recently, very easy to get a visa, to get a work visa, very easy to travel in and out of Hong Kong, uh, it, it, you know, low tax. Um, you know, very business friendly. And the thinking in the years before the protests and certainly the crackdown was that even Xi Jinping, uh, the Xi Jinping and the CCP of today didn't want to give up the so-called goose that laid the golden egg. And that by cracking down on freedoms, they could be risking seriously harming or even destroying a key uh, Asian financial center uh, that needed those very freedoms and especially uh, the, the sense of uh, the you know, uh, the British contract law uh, to survive. What has changed there? And, you know, what allowed that risk in killing the goose that laid the golden egg to occur? And, and I've wondered myself lately whether it was inevitable. Yeah, well, I can't answer whether or not it's inevitable. Um, I think there's a lot of contingency in history, but uh, I think a couple of factors is a great question. Um, one is... Um, from a macroeconomic standpoint, I think Hong Kong matters a lot less than it did in 1997. I mean, China is what, I think it's an $18 trillion economy, obviously second only to the US, much larger than Japan. And yeah, the flows that come through Hong Kong are important. I think much of the you know technology, human know-how that's come through Hong Kong is important, but you know, in a relative sense, it's much, much, much less important than it was in 1997. But I think the more important answer is it shows that for the party, um, you know, staying in power is, and what they regard as security is uh, more important than anything else. And we saw that in 1989 when they killed hundreds, maybe even thousands of their own people of, you know, young students, uh, you know, really many of them, the, the cream of a new generation in, in China, and they, you know, murdered them in the street. And I think in Hong Kong, I mean, they've been, they've done it much more skillfully. Uh, there have been very, very few deaths. And, um, none directly that can be linked to, to security forces killing anybody. Um, but the, the result has been pretty much the same. And I think the party, you know, when it comes to, you know, economics uh, or Hong Kong as a business center, um, the, you know, that's secondary to the party staying in power. And by the way, they've been very clear about this. When Deng Xiaoping met Margaret Thatcher in 19... 82, first time the British prime, a British prime minister had ever gone to, to Beijing, a serving prime minister, and Deng told her the Chinese were definitely taking Hong Kong back in 1997. Thatcher's idea of, of continued British administration was, was a no-go. And she said, you don't understand Hong Kong and you can't run it. And he said, you know, we think we can run it. And if we can't and we wreck it, so be it. We're taking it. And so I think they've always been very, very clear that politics will trump economics if push comes to shove in Hong Kong. They hope they could have it both ways. They did for a while. Maybe, as you say, it was inevitable that it wasn't going to last. But politics was always going to win. Yeah. And I like how in the book you would you say that you address this line that so many of us heard you know, living there all the time. Uh, that Hong Kong was becoming just another mainland city. And you say that's the wrong frame for that question. Uh, why is that the case? Why is this crackdown in Hong Kong um, more concerning than just to the 7.5 million people, though fewer every day, who live there? Why, why is it not just becoming another 
Yeah. Uh, in that city. I think there are two, if I can answer that in two parts. The first thing is you would rather be in Beijing or Shanghai right now because you know what the rules are, you know, the red lines, you know, things are pretty clear. In Hong Kong, the, the lines as to what's going to literally get you thrown in jail with no prospect of bail are unclear from day to day. I mean, we had a we had a, a protester thrown in jail a week or so ago because he was thinking uh, or planning a, a one man protest against the Olympics. Um, you know, we've had a speech therapist who's been sitting in jail for the better part of a year because she was involved with a children's book that had wolf and wolves and sheep. And I guess that was somehow uh, against national security or sedition or something, but she's in jail on national security law charges. So nobody really knows what the rules are in Hong Kong. So I think it's it's worse than than almost any mainland city, with the exception of cities in Xinjiang and Tibet. And I think you, we have to think of Hong Kong. I think Beijing views Hong Kong through a frame of peripheral region full of troublemakers. And think about it. What's on the periphery? Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong. They're far away and uh, they cause a lot of trouble for, for China. And so rather than trying to mollify them or work with people, I mean, the, the, the thing seems to be kind of strike hard and, and uh, you know, kind of just keep whacking them till there's nothing left. Um, now, the broader question, I think, why does this matter to the rest of the world? I think China's willingness to destroy a place like Hong Kong, that, you know, honestly, what was the, what threat did Hong Kong pose to China? I mean, what did Hong Kong do? You're saying what military threat? Yeah, or what threat was was Hong Kong really seriously going to become independent? Were were uh, I mean, Jiang Zemin famously said he you know they were worried after 1989 that the Hong Kong spirit of liberty and freedom would spill over to the mainland. I mean, that clearly wasn't happening. But yeah, you know, every time there's any kind of demonstration, the guys in Beijing seem to see color revolution, and yeah, you know, they were obviously seared by the collapse of the Soviet Union. Arab Spring, uh, some of the um, things that have happened in, in Central Asia, and so they just have to whack down any kind of um, any kind of uprising. But I think the bigger point is what what China did in in Hong Kong is the kind of thing it's trying to do in Lithuania today. It's do, trying to do with Australia, that it's done with South Korea, with the Philippines. I mean, country after country that steps out of line as far as China is concerned. And of course, you know, we can talk about Taiwan is going to be whacked and hit hard. And the Chinese are, you know, seemingly picking quarrels, to use their language, with with a variety of places. And just, I think, using a, a degree of coercion and trying to trying to limit the ability of those of, of us in the in the free world or open societies to to be able to just have discussions like this. If China had their way, we wouldn't be having this discussion. As a matter of fact, you know, technically, they could probably, you know, they they say the national security law applies everywhere. And if they wanted to, Jody, they could come after you and me, according to their way of thinking. Great. Well, uh, we're getting some questions in um, and, and they're dealing with the second part. I'll, I'll show the book if you haven't seen it. Um, the second part is to, today, Hong Kong, tomorrow, the world. And we have uh, Bill Hosting who's asking, uh, what did the People's Republic of China learn in crushing Hong Kong that they intend to apply to the world? So he's getting to the second part of your, the, the title of your book. Well, I think, I think unre, you know, unremitting pressure, but thanks, Bill. It's a really good question. But um, again, I think we're seeing this playbook, uh, let's say Lithuania. Um, they use, they try to co-opt uh, certain parts of, the, also Africa. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that before. They will co-opt uh, certain parts of the elite with, uh, with business uh, favors. They will uh, try to control the media as much as possible, and they will... Um, uh, essentially try to raise the pain threshold for anybody who um, who who goes against them. And Paula Dwyer uh, asked, asked uh, kind of a, a similar uh, related question um, about the Tomorrow the World part. She's saying Ta Taiwan may well be next, but where else might China strike? Well, I don't, I think it's less than, thanks Paula, it's a really good question. Look, clearly, uh, the ability to have the People's Liberation Army in Hong Kong, and I think they would eventually hope in Taiwan, is different. I don't think we're going to see PLA troops um, around the world. Um, uh, I don't think that, you know, even places like the Philippines or, say, Cambodia, which is almost a colony of, of uh, China now, is likely to have troops. So, again, I think that they'll work through elites, uh, work through media, 
And above all, you know, work through the kind of united front organizations that we see even here in the US and in, in London. And one more question before uh, from, from the audience before we return to mine is, how near is Hong Kong today to an international commercial collapse? Hmm. Is there precedent for that sort of decline? Beirut is- uh, <laughs> That's very, example. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I don't know why I'd never thought of the Beirut example. It's very hard to destroy, destroy international financial centers. And I've, you know, I've looked at some of the research and some of the, the the work that's been done on this and, and had discussions with people who a couple of years ago were much more optimistic than I, than I was. Um, uh, look, business can live with pretty draconian laws. Um, if you have a financial center, you know, you've got a kind of uh, almost a first mover advantage and it's, it's hard to dislodge. But the combination of the national security law and the pandemic uh, shows that, you know, China's, you know, really giving that thesis a run for its money. And, you uh, it is it is interesting to think about Beirut because of course they're you know with civil conflict there and that's I guess sort of the case in Hong Kong I mean we're not having we don't have a civil war but um, you've got this deep uh, civil conflict but above all you have a pandemic which makes it impossible to travel so I mean um, Cathay Pacific has effectively been destroyed um, you had sixty million plus visitors in two thousand eighteen. I don't think there are 60,000 this year. Um, it might be closer to 6,000. So you have entire swaths of the economy that are, that are being wiped out. Um, you have, I just saw um, Perno Ricard is asking its um, employ senior employees to move out of Hong Kong because they can't service the region internationally from there. Um, you know, people were in Hong Kong because you could, you could be anywhere in the region and you could be in China. Um, all those borders are closed right now. So nobody can really work. I guess capital can still flow, of course. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if the if it's locked down for another year or so, which seems to be the thinking. Um, and it might be even a more severe lockdown. They're talking in recent days that we might see a Wuhan style lockdown in Hong Kong where people actually can't leave their their flats. Uh, so I, I it just seems hard to imagine with that kind of grinding shutdown that uh you know, Hong Kong's going to just bounce back and become vibrant all of a sudden next year again. Yeah, I'd like to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about a key part of your book. And, and uh, it kind of gives it uh, an insider feel is the chapters where you talk about Jimmy Lai, uh, who we all, many of us um, you know, know of, if not know. Um, and he, as he's the founder of uh, uh, Next Digital and Apple Daily, who, as you say in the book, was among Hong Kong's first political prisoners in the Chinese Communist era. Uh, Lai, who was serving his sentence in jail for taking part in two peaceful demonstrations in 2019 and has been charged with some other things as well, as someone you knew well and, and for years. Um, so first, tell us about him. And, and, and you know, Jimmy Lai has been a controversial figure in Hong Kong and had long been a side, side uh, thorn in the side of the CCP. Uh, and how did he, a, a devout Catholic and a businessman who made three separate fortunes, become such a threat uh, to China? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. And I've, I've thought about that a lot. I mean, here's a guy who, um, I mean, he's, he's, he epitomizes the Hong Kong success story. He, he came to Hong Kong at the age of 12 as an illegal immigrant in the bottom of a, hidden in the bottom of a fishing boat in a sampan. Uh, lived and worked in a, in a textile factory. I mean, he was a child laborer, let's be frank about it. Uh, taught himself English by uh, reading a dictionary. Uh, first bought into, an, you know, was a textile mill owner. Then he founded the Giordano retail uh, chain, kind of fast fashion before its time. And, and after Tiananmen, it, it was not a political guy. He was like in the rag trade, right? He was just a Hong Kong entrepreneur who enjoyed life and was radicalized by the uh, June 4th, 1989 killings. And well, he, he took part or he supported the democracy movement when the students were, were there in the spring of 89. Um, and after that founded first Next Magazine and then Apple Daily. Uh, I guess the fact that the Chinese can't silence him and he has resources and he has contacts and he knows a lot of people around the world and he's you know been very open to media people uh, seems to drive the Chinese um, insane. I mean, it's hard for them because if they allow one person to be free, well, then the next person wants to be free. And so I think they need to make an example and they need to when they are trying to to break him. So 
He's been in jail um, pretty much nonstop since the beginning of December a year ago. He was let out for a couple of days uh, and basically under house arrest over Christmas, the Christmas week um, in 2020. Um, he's in a maximum security prison. He's a 74-year-old diabetic, as you say, a practicing a very devout Roman Catholic um, who's always preached nonviolence. And yet every time he's in court, they put him in manacles and he's in 30, 35 pounds, whatever it is of heavy chains, just to humiliate him and to show the world what they can do to someone, that they can basically treat him like a caged animal. And, and for what? For asking really just for freedom, for doing what he'd been doing for 26 years running the newspaper. And uh, I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, he for many years said, they're going to come after me. I'm going to be, you know, target number one. They're going to put me in jail. And, you know, you always think, really, you know, is it really that bad? I mean, Hong Kong seems like it's OK, but, you know, I was wrong. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you about press freedom, something near and dear to the hearts of many of us on this call. Um, you know, given uh, that, I'd like to sort of talk about what did Apple Daily go too far here? Um, there's some, you know, there's some that say the protesters in 2019 did uh, in their calls for democracy uh, and their anti-Chinese rhetoric uh, kind of bought a ticket to this, that China was never going to let this happen. And that some say that that Jimmy Lai bought a ticket to it uh, as well with uh, his calls for uh, democracy in his newspaper, something that they could actually come and shut down. And, and we saw them shut it down uh, very sadly. And I mean, I was there in 2020 right after national security law took effect uh, when they, you know, perp walked him through his own newsroom, rifled through. I mean, it was an incredible scene, 200 police uh, through that newsroom. And when we at the FCC put out a statement um, decrying this, uh, the foreign ministry told us to mind our own business. Uh, so that sort of, I think, marked sort of the beginning of what many of us saw as a new chapter in press freedom uh, in Hong Kong. But I'd like to engage a little bit with that question of, of Apple Daily, which was, you know, they, they were not a polite newspaper. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, so let me rhetorically and, and half seriously ask you, throw the question back to you. Did the FCC go too far in putting out that statement? Because the foreign ministry just slapped you guys down and they're come, they keep coming after you. Maybe you'll lose your, you lose your lease. Should you guys, and I don't know if you debated this internally, when I was on the board there, we used to have these debates, you know, should the FCC be in, engaged in these sorts of, uh, of issues? Um, uh, I, I, for one, I'll answer the question because it's rhetorical. I think the FCC was perfectly proper to do that. And I think um, I, I think your question is one that a lot of people ask, but I, I think it's, um, it's, it's easy to answer. They, I don't think you should blame the victim. Um, Hong Kong people wanted what was promised to them by the Chinese. The Chinese in the treaty with the, with the Brits in the basic law and in hundreds of statements from the most senior leaders down to you know local level people all promised hong kong democracy hong kong people ruling hong kong and a high degree of autonomy i'm not really sure how exercising that particularly when those promises weren't being fulfilled is the fault of the victim who and by the way these victims are in jail we have seven people counting Jimmy Lai from Apple Daily, Next Digital, in jail right now. They've been there, well, most of Jimmy's been there over a year, as I said, most of them have been there since last June, last July. They haven't been tried, let alone convicted. They won't, they're not granted bail. I mean, is that is it their fault that they ran a newspaper just as they've been running it for 26 years, and then overnight, the Chinese decide to throw them in the slammer for that? And I, again, no I agree with you, but I, yeah, I, I know, I know. I'm there, sure you there do. Are some, but that yeah. becomes the issue, and and that and this and it gets reported this way, certainly in the Chinese press, that you know that this was a person who had it coming, and when actually when we put out our statement at the FCC, it was you don't understand, you are meddling in a you know with somebody. This is not about press freedom. This is about other things. And, you know, how dare you get in the middle of this? That was yeah. what essentially the foreign ministry said to us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, I think I got attacked for something recently by one of the former chief executives who, who seems to have a thing for the FCC, too. And you now it's sort of like you, you guys don't like him because he's a troublemaker, because he won't shut, sit down and shut up and kowtow to you. I mean, that's really what they don't like. And 
Um, sure. I mean, it was a very aggressive newspaper, and I certainly would not defend everything that they did over those 26 years. I don't think anybody did it would, including Jimmy Lai, by the way. You know, they definitely made some mistakes, and they did some, you know, things that, uh, you know, I think Bloomberg, for example, would not do. Um, but that doesn't mean that they should just be sitting in jail and that we should have had a company that was, by the way, a publicly listed company with a market value of about $100 million. It was destroyed overnight by the government. Uh, assets have been seized. They're now be, it's places being dismembered. You know, close to a thousand people lost their jobs, including 600 journalists. And, you know, we go on. You know, is that their fault? You know, is that the fault of the victim? I don't think so. I think it's because China can't take countervailing center, you know, centers of power. It cannot take dissent. It can't take discussion. It has to have, you know, it's like a God, right? It's like a religion. It has to have the one and the only way, the only truth. And Jimmy Lai just militantly refused to accept that. Uh, Bill Holstein asks a good related question. How long can the Western media presence in Hong Kong last? Well, you address this somewhat in your book. Yeah, I mean, you have Western media in Beijing and in Shanghai, you know, obviously limited. About the only place you don't have it is, is Pyongyang, I guess. I don't think Hong Kong is going the way of the DPRK, but, um, you know, I suppose it's possible. I mean, you don't have Western media really in Xinjiang and in, in uh, Tibet. Uh, so I guess that could be a precedent. But I think Hong Kong is going to remain as a major city. And as long as they keep giving visas, there's at least going to be some limited presence. I have to say, I mean, Bill, it's, you know, when, you know, I've known Bill a long time and when we first knew each other, um, it was, you know, in, and I had lived in Korea. I, I went there uh, in the eighties when it was still, a, um, you know, under military, essentially under military rule. The idea that the New York times would have editorial people in Seoul because they couldn't be in Hong Kong for one reason or another, initially for visa reasons, is just mind boggling to me that in the space of 30 years, a place like South Korea that's uh, under military control becomes you know, a very open society. And a place like Hong Kong that seems so open is a place where they throw children's storybook illustrators into jail without bail. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty mind boggling. Um, Patty Krantz asks a good question, uh, saying she's not a Chinese expert, but wasn't Hong Kong independence uh, in the treaty limited to a certain period? Were Hong Kong citizens naive to think that it would be longer than that? Well, it, it wasn't independence. It was a high degree of autonomy. It had some of the trappings of, uh, of a sovereign state, I guess, its own tax system, its own currency, its own government administration. And it was for 50 years. We're coming up to the halfway mark on July 1st. So we didn't even make it halfway. Maybe we were naive to think we could have 50 years, but Deng Xiaoping said that if it went well, we could it could just keep going on past that. So I think people really were looking to a full 50 years. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get back to, to uh, Next Digital and your own story. You have some great details in the book about your personal role in this. Uh, especially as a board member at Next Digital, and some of the personal pressure you felt as things became more heated in Hong Kong. Actually, it was interesting. I, I thought interesting detail that you had some pressure uh, even before the protests and the uh, crackdown, not being invited on some other boards for which you were very qualified and had been put up because uh, you were on the Next Digital board. So talk to us about that and, and what that was like and, and what that told you about where Hong Kong might have been going. Yeah, well... Look, I knew when I joined the Next Digital Board um, that um, it was not going to go over well among everybody that I associated with. And um, uh, I was the executive director of the Asia Business Council, which was a pan-Asian uh, group of CEOs and chairmen. Um, it, its members were from, I think, 16, 17 different economies from Saudi Arabia to Indonesia to Mongolia and Japan. So it's a pretty big patch, but it had been founded and was headquartered in Hong Kong and had a strong Hong Kong contingent. And uh, I wouldn't say, you know, most of the business community was super sympathetic or friendly with Jimmy Lai, um, but I, I did talk with my uh, board about it and they they were aware that I'd taken this. And, you know, this is 2018. I was an independent non-executive director. So, um you know, I, I I knew there might be trouble down the road. I didn't think that two years later it was, you know, sort of really going to come to a head. Um, but shortly after I joined uh, that incident you you allude to, someone asked me if if I would, you know, if it was okay if you put my name up for a board. 
And uh, I said, yeah, fine, but full disclosure, you should know I've just joined uh, the next digital board instantly. I can't do it. It's a mainland company. Forget it. You know, so I mean, anything to do with Jimmy Lai was basically radioactive and uh, had been for quite some time. There had been an advertising boycott that HSBC and other multinationals took part in for years against Apple Daily. I mean, there were just so many different uh, things, you know, denial of service attacks, hacking, uh, you know, investigations into alleged corruption, um, because, you know, they were determined to, I, I think at heart, they, they, you know, the communists really see a very conspiracy minded world. And they believe that Jimmy Lai was an American agent and he was funneling cash from the CIA or from the US. And that was what was prompting all these demonstrations. And he was, the, he, I, I, I believe that he probably helped fund uh, a lot of the democracy movement. I believe that was him. Um, I don't think there's any evidence it's ever shown otherwise, but part of this is a fa failure of imagination on the part of the Hong Kong elites to imagine that their own citizens were smart enough, not having gone to Harvard or Oxford or anything, were still smart enough to demonstrate and, you know, kind of out with the police and the government and be, you know, much more innovative in their tactics. But um, the, the next digital thing, Obviously, after the national security law came in, got a lot heavier. And you mentioned the the perp walk through um, through the newsroom. A few months before that, I'd been on the on my way to have breakfast with Jimmy when I got a, first a call from his uh, secretary saying he can't, I couldn't didn't say why I just can't meet you for breakfast. Uh, that's a little strange. Look at my email. Jimmy sent me an email. I'm being arrested. Oh, okay. I see why you can't meet me. That's for why. Breakfast. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, then that 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 perp walk and they took uh, they it turns out we, we had a director's meeting and I was the only director not in jail who was in Hong Kong at that point. So that was a little disconcerting. Um, I, uh, I continued to do well, they started after the national security law. Jimmy and I did a series of um, of live things like, you know, live streams. Basically, it wasn't Zoom. It was a live stream um, Facebook, I guess. And. Uh, you know, we had a, everybody from Chris Patton to Nathan Sharansky to Cardinal Zen, uh, just a great, you know, really interesting group of people talking about what was going on in Hong Kong. But that ended when his bail was revoked and um, uh, in December a year ago, as I said, and among many reasons, the prosecutor uh, adduced that he should be in jail was that I had made some anodyne remark about uh, how he was a symbol of Hong Kong resistance, which obviously I think is true, factually. Um, but things, you know, have gone from bad to worse. And uh, I, I don't want to go on and on, except to say that there are still, as far as I know, ongoing investigations into us by somewhere between two and four Hong Kong government agencies, because they are determined to have the world believe that free press is alive and well in Hong Kong. And the only reason that Next Digital collapsed is because of these lousy directors who just ran the company into the ground. So, you know, that's, uh, I'm waiting to see the report on that, which should have been given to the financial secretary a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I don't know, you know, I'm sure they'll slam us and I'll just be interested to see what they say. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move on a little bit and talk about uh, COVID and the role the outbreak played and continues to play actually in China's uh, actions in Hong Kong and, and what the local government is doing. Uh, you know, this all took place. The national security law took place. The, the protests ended after, you know, when COVID started. Um, and uh, then this became this kind of, you know, train that just kept moving that, uh, you know, through its own force. How, and, and now we see even, you know, further tightening um, of the grip on Hong Kong because of COVID. Can you talk a little bit about that? You, you mentioned that in the book, it's sort of this cover under which a lot of this was able to occur, occur right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you know, again, I think we have to wait a little longer to see how this plays out, but it's, it's, it's almost like if COVID didn't exist, they would have had to invent it for, yeah. for Hong Kong. It's, uh, it's been a very, very convenient pretext to arrest people, you know, the June, uh, you know, the June 4th commemorations, when, which went on for 30 years, um, ended in 2020. And that's one of the reasons Jimmy Lai is in jail right now. It's one of the offenses he's been convicted for is that he, he lit a candle uh, all by himself and didn't call for anybody to do anything, but that was regarded as taking part in a demonstration, which had been outlawed. And one reason that people couldn't demonstrate was because you couldn't have more than four people because of COVID. So there's just, you know, reason after reason that uh, people can't take part politically because of COVID. 
you know, I think there's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of short term thing. I think the bigger picture and something that's going to be with us much longer is the kind of techno surveillance that has been rolled out. And it's um, obviously, you know, much more advanced in China and, of course, in places like Xinjiang, where they've got facial recognition and other ways of, you know, you know, looking at people's walk, their gait to, you know, uh, pick people out of a crowd. Um, so it's you know, it's been very interesting because this is a kind of real life, real time uh, test of the surveillance um, methods that China is trying to impose on its people and on on Hong Kong. And uh, I think there's been interesting resistance from Hong Kong. I mean, there's it's funny and there's resistance to vac vaccinations. One reason Hong Kong can't open up uh, is uh, that people don't want to be vaccinated because they don't trust the government. It's funny. I talked to some of my friends there and they they say, why should I get vaccinated? There's no COVID and I don't trust the government anyway. Um, I should also say the fact that they're using um, the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac is, um, you know, which isn't as effective, uh, doesn't help. Um, but I talk to people in Hong Kong who don't want it. They won't take their phone when they go out. They only want to use cash. They don't want to use their octopus card because you don't want to be tracked because if you and I, for example, had lunch in a, in a restaurant, Jody, and somebody, you know, five tables over tested positive until about a week ago, they would uh, just, they'd throw us in, um, uh, I was going to say a concentration camp, a and quarantine camp at, yeah. at, at Penny's <laughs> Bay. They've had to back off on that because the numbers are, are so big. But what they're doing is they're having lockdowns. Uh, they're just, they're basically scooping people up in Hong Kong as they do in the mainland. And yes, there is a, uh, you know, there are, you can definitely argue the science uh, on this, but it does seem clear that they they also they like the control part. And this is, you know, I think a dry run for ensuring that they can control everybody, you know, in Hong Kong all the time. And, you know, COVID or no COVID. Yeah, there's certainly a strong surveillance aspect to it, correct? Of this Leave Home Safe app you have to use whenever you go anywhere. Yeah. We've got a couple of good questions. Uh, one from uh, Pete Angardio, who says, first of all, great to see you again, Mark. Hi, Pete. Uh, and he says, aside from civil liberties and security, what is happening to the rule of law regarding business? Good question. And follows it up by saying, will there still be any legal advantage to being based in Hong Kong as opposed to, say, Shanghai or Shenzhen? Yeah, I, Pete, great question. I can't see you on the screen, but uh, thanks for taking part. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, it's, that question is not fully answered. It's clear that there are handpicked judges who are overseeing the national security law cases and, um, you know, they're engaged in lawfare. I mean, they're engaged in using the, the kind of veneer of rule of law to uh, reach predetermined political ends. Uh, now, is that going to uh, affect uh, commercial law? Don't know. I mean, I, th I think it's, it's just too early to say. I mean, there are a lot of, there are people who are worried, right? Um, but I don't think that we can point to, I, I don't know of any hard evidence that says uh, judges um, are ruling in favor of a mainland cadre versus, uh, you know, a, a U.S. multinational, for example. I think it, it raises a question about Hong Kong's uh, role as an international arbitration center, which, uh, interestingly, Teresa Chang, the current Secretary for Justice, had done a lot of work on. Um, so it's, it's a you know, sad irony that um, she's presiding over, you know, I just think, a real assault on rule of law. I mean, beyond the national security law cases, um, we have 10,000 plus people who were arrested on political charges in 2019 and, and 2020. Only about a quarter of those have been charged. Uh, the arrests uh, hang over people's heads. It's it's a uh, kind of peculiar fe feature of the Hong Kong, I guess, you know, coming out of the British legal system. So, you know, so in other words, the overwhelming majority of the political cases are not um, are not NSL charges. Um, I, you know, my understanding from talking to people who are working with prisoners is you know, it, it still really depends on the judge. judges. It's not as kind of black and white, you know, we're just going to lock them all up forever, as, as you might think. Um, but, you know, there's obviously people are getting longer sentences, and it's harsher than it was, you know, five years ago or something on, on you know, political, you know, kind of protest related uh, charges. So, you know, I guess the thing is, let's wait and see. It'd be great if somehow, you know, you're able to keep these two tracks separate. It, you know, the history of these things is, is pretty hard, you know, to, you know, have one stream for political offenses and then be completely, uh, you know, kind of above board and even handed uh, on commercial disputes. 
And we have a somewhat related question from Bill Holstein. Uh, have the Chinese extended the great firewall of, of the internet to control and monitor Hong Kong's communications? Uh, I guess I'll add, you know, do you think that will happen? And if it does, uh, will that affect the ability of international companies to operate from Hong Kong? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. I mean, just this week, we saw Hong Kong Watch has been blocked by the major uh, internet providers in Hong Kong. Hong Kong Watch is a UK-based uh, NGO, um, um, which Chris Patton and other, you know, from the Chinese standpoint, undesirables are involved with. Um, and um, yeah, so they, I think it was two or three days ago, just earlier this week, their service was, was blocked. And um, yeah, I think we're going to, we're going to see that increasingly. And, um, you know, they'll start with NGOs and, um, you know, then they'll go to more sensitive, you know, other political sites, and then they'll go to news sites. And um, yeah, it'll be like being in Beijing. And I guess companies somehow figure out ways to work around it, but your work, you're just, you're in a fundamentally different business cultural, political, social environment than you were 10 years ago. You're you're like Beijing, or I would argue, you know, in some respects, you're worse than Beijing. Right now, still better because the firewall is, is you know, not really, you know, fully enforced. But I, I, I think it's inevitable that it will be. And you think that will lead, uh, just follow up on that, that will lead to more uh, media companies having more challenges, uh, so to speak, there and, yeah. and perhaps doing what the New York Times has, has done by moving. Well, they moved their Asia headquarters to, to so. Yeah, yeah, and it's just so. Look, you'll you'll have correspondence there. I mean, it would be interest. You know, it'd be interesting to know if um, uh, you know, somebody with a permanent residence card in Hong Kong who was who they didn't want to let in, if they would still let them in as a media worker. Um. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure many of us on this call would or, you know, either would fall into this category or know people who would. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, obviously the prognosis isn't good. Yeah, but it could be that basically people just cover Beijing and Shanghai. I mean, Hong Kong will just be sort of a minor place. A, you know, it's like maybe it's like a Monaco or something where a lot of rich Chinese come and they've, you know, it's a nicer lifestyle and they, you know, the mountains are nice and you can go out on your junk on the weekends and the apartments are nice and, you know, the tax rate is low and that's it. But what's happening in Monaco? I don't know how big the Bloomberg Bureau in Monaco is, but it's probably small. I don't think we have one. Yeah, so <laughs> I rest my case. Um, so I'd like to come back to some of the uh, other issues in the second part, you know, tomorrow, the world. Um, it, how is Hong Kong kind of a test case for this? We talked about the history and the unusual, um, you know, how all this came to be and, and the events of 2019 and 2020. Um, how, how do you take that and that very particular kind of example of Hong Kong and make it a template for what China could do elsewhere? Right. Well, OK, first of all, Taiwan. And, uh, you know, if they have their way and Xi Jinping, you know, kind of realizes what he thinks is, is his historical mission to uh, bring Taiwan back into the fold, then I think you'll you know, that's a very clear template. Right. I mean, you go after education, as is being done in Hong Kong very aggressively. Now you go after media, you go after civil society and destroy NGOs, eventually you go after free churches, which we think is you know, one of the last areas to be rolled up in Hong Kong. So, I mean, that's pretty clear. I think uh, where, um, you know, the analogy uh, is not, it's quite as precise is, again, I don't think you're going to have Chinese um, troops in, um, well, we do have some in Djibouti and some other places now, I guess, but let's let's take Cambodia or, uh, or Lithuania for an example. Cambodia is probably a better example because, I think that you'll you're, you're seeing, you know, Hun Sen says, who do I call for help if not the Chinese? You know, you can use the renminbi. So I think you're going to see, you know, and we've seen the no coincidence. Um, strong men like Hun Sen will work with the strong men from Beijing. It's no coincidence that the free media in Cambodia is, is finished, right? Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that the Chinese are selling um, internet and other, uh, you know, mobile telecoms technology um, to, to Africa, often working through corrupt elites to have, and by the way, your colleague, you know, our friend Sheridan Prasso has written about this for, for Business Week, working with local elites to sell high-priced equipment, which can also be used for surveillance and enriches the elites who then will, I think, do Beijing's bidding. I'm not saying they're going to have Chinese national security law curriculum in 
you know, uh, an African, you know, textbook, but I can tell you that Taiwan, the maps that they have in there are going to reflect what China wants, just as, you know, Delta, United, other American airlines had to redraw their maps to make it clear that Taiwan was not a sovereign country. So uh, I think it'll be on all these little issues, you know, it'll first be on, on maps and kind of high, and issues about Taiwan and about Hong Kong. But, you know, eventually, I mean, look at how Norway was punished when a Chinese um, dissident, Lu Xiaobo, was given the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, they, they basically locked Norway out for eight years, despite all this kowtowing by Norway. It wasn't until after Lu Xiaobo died in Chinese custody that, that the, uh, the Chinese eased up on the, on the Norwegians. And I think it's very unlikely you're going to see another Nobel Peace Prize laureate from China for a long, long time. So I don't know. I mean, is that is Norway less free? Well, yeah, they are because their Peace Prize Committee can't necessarily pick. I mean, there are a lot of good candidates. I'm not saying that a Chinese person should win, but they can't actually pick uh, freely from among the candidates, even for something as as kind of, I don't know, I would say non-controversial as a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Patty Krantz is asking uh, what uh, what about Lithuania? in particularly what are they doing in Lithuania? Yeah, I'm sure given your time in, in Russia, you're probably watched, watching that very closely. Um, so yeah, I think Lithuania is a really interesting example. They, uh, okay, they're a, they're a Baltic country and the Hong Kongers drew inspiration from the Baltics and they actually had about 200,000 people out in something called the Baltic Way in Hong Kong in uh, end of August um, 2019. And it was commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Baltic Way that took place as those uh, three countries, um, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, were getting their independence in the, you know, sort of shortly before the Soviet Union fell apart. And so the Baltics in Hong Kong are, you know, they're these small countries and they have, I think, a, a lot of a lot of ties. And so Lithuania has been very um, supportive of, of Hong Kong. Um, and by the way, they've had when they pro when they had protesters in support of Hong Kong, getting back to the earlier question about what we're gonna see, you had the Chinese ambassador. Uh, to Lithuania watching as a group of uh, thugs beat up uh, pro Hong Kong protesters in Lithuania. So those are the, also the kinds of tactics I think we're going to increasingly see abroad. We see this in Chinatown in London where um, uh, mainland thugs beat up Hong Kong protesters at an anti-Asian hate rally of all of all things. So, um, but Lithuania is being punished because it's standing with Taiwan. It stood with Hong Kong and it had the temerity to open a Taiwan trade office, essentially a quasi embassy. And so because of that, actually China is threatening the whole EU pro project. They're telling German automakers that they, well, they're telling the Lithuanians, they just actually took out the country code for Lithuania. So Lithuania can't import or export anything to China because uh, it, there's no country code. China says it hasn't done anything against the WTO. Just sorry, you don't exist as a country. So that's an interesting way of zeroing out a, a nation. Um, but then they've gone further and they've told German automakers that they can't use components uh, made or assembled in Lithuania for cars or for you know for export to China. I mean, so it's actually thrown the EU into um, I don't want to say turmoil, but it's it's really. Uh, testing ties within within the EU. So we think China has a capacity for for mischief making that is, uh, you know, quite at odds with its earlier claim that it was a, you know, going kind to of have a peaceful rise. Uh, and the role of the US in all this. Um, so we saw the US during the protests, um, you know, uh, take steps in Congress, the US Congress, Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell got together on something, he was majority leader in the Senate at the time, uh, to basically say, if you're not going to support these, uh, you know, and they called it in the legislation, pro-democracy pro efforts, um, we are going to rescind uh, parts of our trade agreements, you know, as essentially allowing very free trade in, in Hong Kong. Now, some would say that actually punished U.S. businesses doing business in Hong Kong more than it did the, the, the you know, Chinese government. But the U.S. is very clear on this. The U.K. is very clear on this. The U.K. is now, um, you know, saying to uh, Hong Kong residents, come, we will make you citizens. So, you know, we give you a path to citizenship, um, and, you know, make it easy for you to come to, to the U.K. Has that made it worse? Has that made the, the crackdown worse on Hong Kong? 
Yeah, I, I think we have to be realistic about the limits of, of US power, of, of any nation's power, and particularly with a country as large as, as China, an economy, as I said earlier, that's as, you know, as significant as China's, there's a limit to you know, what, the, what impact it really has. Um, I, I, are, I think that going forward, um, we need to think really hard about uh, our reliance on, on China. Um, let, uh, let me get back to that point in a minute. I, I don't know that the uh, actual impact um, economically has been very great. I mean, we've sanctioned some Hong Kong officials, they've sanctioned some US officials. Um, uh, you know, but look, pension fund money is probably going from your pension, your 401k into China today. I mean, we certainly haven't been shutting off the, the flow of money. I mean, Wall Street is, you know, continuing to cozy up with, um, with China. Um, so I can't say that it, you know, really had any material impact. I think it had a moral impact in, in uh, Hong Kong. Um, and by the way, the, the UK um, announcement that you alluded to where people who had what was called a BNO, British National Overseas Passport, who in the past would not have a path to citizenship in, um, in Britain um, now do. And they're thinking of extending that so that the children of those people would uh, also have a path to citizenship. And uh, Already, I think in the first year of that, or year or so, year and a half of that um, plan, I think something like 90,000 or 100,000 people have, have already applied or come. I mean, the numbers are pretty significant in this city the size of Hong Kong. Um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, after the US election in 2020, I had just returned. Um, I was talking to a friend in Hong Kong and he said, uh, oh, everybody's so sad. I said, why? He goes, oh, well, you know, Trump lost the election. <laughs> and I mean, Hong Kong is one place that Trump would have won in a landslide. You know, we can, we can, you know, talk about whether or not his policies were effective or whether he really knew how to deal with Xi Jinping or not. But the Hong Kong people loved his rhetoric on Hong Kong. And, you know, Mike Pompeo was very popular. Um, Taiwan, same thing. So, you know, whether or not the the policies have really proven effective. I think the jury's out, um, but uh, they certainly have um, buoyed uh, sentiment among the pro-democracy people in Hong Kong. And I think there's, you know, quite frankly, a lot of concern among the Biden people that, uh, or among among Hong Kongers and Taiwanese now, as to whether or not um, the Biden administration uh, will be as tough on China, given. Um, you know, given the record of, of the Obama and the Clinton administrations. Uh, I think so far those fears have proven unjustified, but again, you know, time will tell. Yeah, well, they've kept, they've kept a lot of the tariffs in place. And things. Yes, yeah, no, so that's been very interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, so one last question before I, I toss it back to Patty. Um, oh, before I say that, um, there's a link and here's the book. Uh, look for it and, and you can uh, get it to the link. And I guess uh, you uh, you must be on Amazon, right? It must be available on Amazon. I'm on Amazon, all good booksellers. And I would also encourage you to, you know, patronize your local independent bookseller as well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, the St. Martin's Press people have been great to, to work with. They've been very supportive. I love the cover uh, and, um, you know, everything about the book. So thanks for the pitch. Great, great. Okay, one last uh, lightning round question. So we, so we all don't leave this terribly depressed. Is, is there any hope? Is there any hopeful note um, that, you know, this, this could uh, be lessened or changed or, uh, or even something about the people of Hong Kong and their resilience? Yeah. Well, um, look, a short term, I, as I said, I don't think we've hit bottom yet. I remember I was on an OPC um, roundtable a year or so ago. Um, and uh, I mean, you were involved with that as well. And, and I remember thinking, wow, you know, you guys think it's going to become just another Chinese city, but we haven't nearly hit bottom. But even I couldn't imagine how far we could keep falling. So short term, I don't think the, the outlook's uh, very good. I think Hong Kong people are, well, number one, we've never seen an authoritarian regime, you know, last indefinitely. And um, I don't think the CCP is going to be any um, any exception? Uh, Jamie Dimon was probably going out on a limb a little bit when he said that J.P. Morgan would outlast the Chinese Communist Party. I don't want to comment on that, except to say that nothing lasts forever. Uh, and uh, I do think that the Hong Kong people have proven remarkably resilient. And there are, you know, many, many small acts of defiance. There's, you know, still, you know, there's still more than 7 million people living in Hong Kong, even with the outflow. Um, most of those people in their hearts, you know, uh, support an open 
society. And uh, I think there, some of them are working, some of them are waiting, but um, I hope that they live long enough to, to see a different, a different time and uh, a better time. And Hong Kong will never go back to what it was, but there's no reason it couldn't, it couldn't be a remarkable and open um, city again. I think more broadly, uh, China's actions um, are waking the rest of the world up uh, to its its true nature. And look, I spent somebody I spent more than three decades um, in Asia, twenty eight years in Hong Kong, uh, you know, working for and believing in engagement. I don't think that I was naive. I was perhaps a little more optimistic than if events have proven, but. Um, uh, you know, we we need to stay engaged, but um, we also need to make sure that we're not unduly reliant on China. And I think if this, if the the pandemic, the combination of the pandemic and China's ability seemingly to to create enemies where it had none, is I think waking the world up. And so I think we're going to hopefully see more of a kind of multilateral effort for open societies to take care of themselves and to defend themselves and their interests in economic, social, political. And um, I guess that's the best I can hope for, for a silver lining. It, you know, it's, it's slow to change. It's like turning an aircraft carrier and, you know, at least we're now starting to, to turn, but uh, I think there's, there's obviously a long way to go. So thanks very much for your interest and, uh, great to have a lot of old friends on, on this call as well and look forward to seeing everybody in person. Great. Well, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks for writing this book. Uh, and I will toss it back to Patty. Thank you. Thank you both for a really fascinating discussion, though a little depressing, frankly. <laughs> but uh, please buy Mark's book. And we're very uh, thankful to both of you for such a wonderful program. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, bye-bye.